Hey everyone, it's Colin, how's it going? A while back, I reviewed IKEA's first Bluetooth speaker and found that it's surprisingly good for its low price. This time, let's figure out how they did it. So there are two sizes for this speaker, the smaller NB20 that I reviewed and the larger NB30, which we'll talk about a bit later. If you're not sure what this speaker's all about, definitely go check out that review. I'll hit you with the link. Long story short, it sounds amazing considering it only costs 50 bucks US. So let's tear it down and see what's going on inside. These little rubber covers hide eight screws on the back. I struggled for a minute trying to get the back off until I realized that there are two more screws hidden inside the mounting bracket holes. There's a few cables that connect the front panel to the back that I had to unplug, and looking at that panel, it seems like IKEA took acoustic design pretty seriously. There's foam tape around the edge to prevent air leaks and help the base port work better. There's actually not a whole lot in the front housing. The compartment for the optional lithium ion battery is at the bottom and the battery itself costs 20 bucks and is rated for 2600 milliamp hours at about 14 volts. I think these packs would actually work pretty well for DIY electronics projects. They're reasonably inexpensive and it'd be pretty simple to 3D print an enclosure for them. Towards the top, there's a small PCB for the front panel rotary encoder and status LED, and next to it is the one inch soft dome tweeter. Neither the tweeter nor the three inch woofer below it have any sort of brand markings, but the numbers printed on them are similar. I couldn't dig up any info on these drivers, so I'm guessing they're unique to the Enneby lineup. What's on the back panel is much more interesting. It has two boards, the AC power supply and the amplifier PCB. I like that they're separate as it reduces concerns about electrical interference and isolation between mains and DC voltages. Everything connects to the amp board, which also includes the battery charge controller circuitry. The Bluetooth module is positioned at the top edge and comes in the form of a daughter board. It's based on the CSR A64110 chip from Qualcomm, and the module is actually a standard part. I found them for sale on Alibaba for like five bucks. It supports Bluetooth 4 and offers mono audio output, which is fine since the whole speaker only plays in mono anyway. IKEA actually left some functionality unused because it supports audio input for speakerphone use, but Anaby doesn't have a microphone. Other than Bluetooth, there's an analog audio input on the back in the form of a three and a half millimeter jack. You know, the thing your phone might not have anymore? That one accepts stereo input and the signal passes through a pair of Japan Radio Corporation 2115 series op amps, one each for the left and right channels. The Bluetooth module's audio goes through an op amp as well, but just one since it's mono. Both audio feeds go into a Texas Instruments HC4066 series CMOS switch. This chip handles flipping between Bluetooth audio and the aux input when you plug a cable in. But the output of that switch does something interesting. It goes into a TI analog to digital converter. The chip outputs a 24-bit signal at a sample rate that can be configured. I can't say for sure, but my gut is telling me that IKEA set it up to use 48 kilohertz. That digital audio signal goes from the ADC over an I squared S line into a Texas Instruments TAS 5731M digital amplifier chip. It's a class D design and lacks a heat sink, which is interesting to see, but its spec sheet says it doesn't need one. The underside of the PCB though has a number of solder pads directly opposite the chip, which act a bit like a heat sink. It's a creative and actually not uncommon way to add thermal management without really spending any money. Now this amp chip is actually surprisingly capable. Aside from amplifying the audio, it also supports digital processing like equalization, low and high pass filters, and even dynamic range control such as limiting and compression. The woofer and tweeter are hooked up to different outputs on the amp, 
and those low and high pass filters are effectively being used as the crossover. The channel the woofer's on is set up for low pass and the tweeter's channel gets a high pass. It's likely that the limiter is also being used on the woofer's channel to keep it from distorting at high volumes. It rolls off the bass as you crank it up. There's also something interesting going on with the amp's power ratings too. IKEA says the woofer gets 15 watts of power and the tweeter gets 5. Turns out that's due to more magic being done inside the amp. It actually has four output channels and they can be bridged in various ways to drive different loads. Two channels together is good for, you guessed it, 15 watts at 4 ohms, while a single channel can do 8 watts at 2 ohms. Assuming the tweeter is closer to 4 ohms, then that's 5 watts. Woofers generally need more power than tweeters, so that explains the disparity, and it also means that an entire channel on this amp is going unused, which should help reduce heat a bit. So if the amp chip is the muscle of this speaker, let's look at the brains. It's right in the middle of the PCB and comes in the form of an ST32F030 microcontroller. It's based around an ARM Cortex-M0 that operates at up to 48 megahertz, has 32 kilobytes of flash, and 4 kilobytes of RAM. Now that doesn't sound like much, but it's plenty to handle all the functions of the speaker. It does obvious things like controlling power on and off and the LED indicator, but it also connects to several of the other chips. It can initiate pairing mode on the Bluetooth module and also communicates with the amp chip for both the volume control and the user adjustable bass and treble levels. It even monitors the aux input jack to see if a cable's been connected, then tells the CMOS switch to change inputs and gets the Bluetooth module to disconnect so your phone doesn't keep playing music to nowhere. Also related to the microcontroller is a part of the circuit board that caught my attention. Next to a spot labeled J1 are solder pads marked TX, RX, and ground, and near those is the location of an unpopulated switch with positions labeled work and update. This is the programming interface for the microcontroller. It's likely used to write the code to the chip after it's been soldered to the board during manufacturing but it also opens up the possibility for hacking in new functionality. A complaint that I've heard from NB owners is that they want to hook up something like a Google Home Mini or Echo Dot, but NB automatically powers off after 20 minutes of inactivity, and that feature can't be disabled. If someone could dump the code IKEA is using on this microcontroller, it should be possible to remove that timer and reflash the chip. So even though we now have a good idea as to how NAB works, there are still some questions that I haven't been able to answer. One of them is, where's the aux input getting mixed down from stereo to mono? I'm guessing it's done in the amp chip, but why didn't IKEA do it passively at the input jack? That would have cut out one of the op amps, simplify the board layout, and reduce costs a little bit. Also, we know the amp supports equalization, but is there any default sound shaping going on to make the drivers sound better than they normally would? Finally, one would assume that both NAB models use the same Bluetooth module since they have the same capabilities, but IKEA's specs say that the larger NAB30 has a higher Bluetooth radio output power than the smaller NAB20. 9 dBm versus 4. I suspect the larger speaker has a better antenna design, and since that unit lacks battery support, you're more likely to leave it in one place, like on a shelf. So then your phone would more often be farther away from the speaker as you carry it with you around the house, meaning a better antenna would be beneficial. That's a nice bit of forward thinking. But what about the whole cost thing? The smaller speaker sells for 50 bucks without the battery, and the bigger one is 90. That's a decent amount cheaper than a lot of other speakers that offer similar performance. It seems that IKEA's struck a careful balance between functionality, quality, and optimizing their build cost. I found some teardown photos of the NB30 from when it went through FCC certification. 
and it looks like there are a decent number of shared parts between the two models. And even those that are different likely have a lot of the same components. There are plenty of ways IKEA could have dramatically cut costs here, like keeping the entire signal path analog and simplifying the control scheme. But they didn't, and that makes this overall a better product. I suspect IKEA's got a lower profit margin on Enneby than most other stuff it sells, but that may be intentional. This was their first audio device, and perhaps they just want to show that they're serious about it. In any event, analyzing products like this isn't just interesting to me from a technical perspective, but also lends insight into a company's motives and priorities. And this seemingly simple Bluetooth speaker certainly has quite the story to tell. Anyway, if you liked the video, I would appreciate a thumbs up and be sure to subscribe if you haven't already. You can follow me on Twitter and Instagram at thisdoesnotcomp. And as always, Thanks for watching.